Hey everyone, and welcome to Ask Shane Anything. This show is produced because some of you pledge at $7 or more per month at the Ask Shane tier. You're the folks who get to ask questions, but everybody gets to watch the archive. Now, I have something I want to mention at the beginning of Ask Shane Anything, and that is, I would like to do this show once a week, at least. And you guys like the show, you guys watch the show. We, we actually do more views of Ask Shane Anything than we do for a lot of episodes of Pactor Factor. So I know you guys like the show, the problem is, we can't get enough questions to do the show once per week. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know if you guys have just don't have the time. It, we were having the same problem, by the way, with Pactor Factor on our Patreon, here on our Patreon. We cannot get you guys to ask questions anymore for Pactor Factor or for Ask Shane Anything. We're really leaning on the folks at Sifted.net to produce both of these shows at this point. So look, I'm not calling you guys out. I'm just asking why, like what can I do? What can Pactor do? What can anybody do to get you guys to participate a little bit more in our shows? And I thought that's kind of what I the idea of Patreon is to have this sort of dialogue between us and you guys. And that's kind of the fun part of Patreon. But it, it's not working out that way. I don't get it. You guys used to give us more questions than we could ever ask Pactor for Pactor Factor. But now you guys literally will ask like three questions. Three. Come on, guys. We can do better than this. So look, Pactor Factor to me is more important. So if you're going to pick and you're going to say, OK, well, if I'm going to ask questions, I'm going to ask one or the other. Choose Pactor Factor. Please ask questions there. That is a, a bedrock show of Sifted. Uh, so if you're going to choose, please pick Pactor Factor. But it would really be awesome if you guys could just ask questions for both. Um, I really like doing this show, and it seems like you guys like watching it, but we can't do it unless we get questions. Our first question for today's episode comes from AJ Watson. What are your thoughts on unionizing game studios? From your industry experience, what do you believe the pros and cons are? Okay, AJ, um, the odd part about this is that I can answer this question using experience that I've gained in the games industry, but I can also answer this having worked at a business that had pretty much all union employees. So when I was going to school at Temple, um, I lived the first semester in the dorms, met some friends. We were like, let's get out of here and get our own place. We did. Uh, we got an apartment that still basically was on Temple's campus, technically like 20 feet off of campus, whatever. That doesn't really matter. So anyway, myself and two of my friends were living in an apartment. It was Friday night. Um, our one roommate had a date, and so he went across the street to get money for his date. Myself and the other roommate, we left while he went to the ATM machine. We went downtown to go to a friend's birthday party, if I remember correctly. Uh, we got back at like 10 o'clock, I think it was that night. We had parted ways at like 7 p.m. We got back at like 10 o'clock, and the cops were waiting for us at our apartment. And as it turns out, our other roommate, when he went to get money for his date, was mugged and killed at the ATM. So you're probably wondering why I'm bringing this up. Um, one, it was devastating and it was just awful. But two, this this is why I ended up working in a business that had a union workforce. So this happened four days before finals, the semester that it happened. Um, and Temple University was unwilling to work with us at all and basically failed all of my roommate's friends because we couldn't take finals. Like we were I don't think I have to explain why we couldn't take finals. We couldn't take finals and Temple failed all of us. And I was so disgusted and heartbroken that I left college and I went back to central Pennsylvania and lived with my mom for a little while trying to collect myself. Honestly, I was a disaster, a mess. Um, and so while I was home, my mom was the head of HR at this manufacturing company called Masland. Um, and they ended up be changing the name to Lear eventually. But basically what they did was they made carpet for automobiles. Um, it was Maslin, then it was Lear, and then eventually it, it went out of business. But anyway, my mom was the head of HR, and so she got me a job. Nepotism, not denying it. She got me a job at her company, and I was working out in the mill. And the mill is like 115 degrees, and they have these gigantic kettles, and that's what they call them, kettles, that are literally, literally like 40 feet long, 10 feet wide, and like 10 feet deep. And it was just full of like steaming water and dye that dyed the carpet. And so this whole factory was like 115 degrees and hum humidity out, but whatever. So I was there as like a temp. So I did not have to join the union, but everybody else that I worked with there was in the union. And my dad was a coal miner. So I had had some experience when I was younger with the union. My dad didn't have a great experience with the union. He felt like they kind of sold him out a little bit. Um, and then this is my second experience working around union people, or at least knowing what's going on with unions. And at least once per day, 
at least once per day, one of the union employees would come up to me and tell me to, to start working slower, that I was making the union employees look bad. And I was just like, dude, I don't want to lose my job, so I'm going to work. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. I'm supposed to sacrifice my job for being lazy so that you don't get in trouble. And then the, the crazy part about it was that they could do whatever they wanted. The union protected them so much, they could literally tell their supervisors to F off and wouldn't even get anything. No punishment at all. If they didn't want to do something, they would just say, I don't want to do it. And they would say, talk to my union rep or whatever. Um, it was it was a little disturbing. At the same time, I understand why unions exist. Because if unions don't exist, then it's particularly in jobs like that where they're really awful working conditions. Companies can really take advantage of workers. And so I think it's also kind of on, for me personally, it's an industry by industry case as to where the, whether unions are needed. And generally, in my opinion, unions are needed in any position where the company, the supervisors, can essentially abuse the workforce. And you need the union to be able to step in there and make sure that that does not continue to happen. Now, game developers, like if you were to... <laughs> If I could go back and go back into that carpet mill and talk to the union employees there and say, hey, 15, 20 years from now, more than that, actually, there's going to be game developers who sit in air conditioned offices and work on computers all day. They're going to be disgruntled and they're going to say they don't want. I think they would say, I'll stand up for my union brothers because that's just how unions are. But I think in the back of their mind, they would also say, oh, my God, they wouldn't last a day at my job. So unionization and game development, I, I hate to be wishy-washy on this show, but it's hard to figure out whether it would be good or not. Because my personal experience was that the union hurt production at the company. There's no denying that. I saw people, I would catch people, these machines that they would use to make the carpet are literally the size of a house. And they would have like a machine that brings all this yarn in and actually makes a carpet. But up above the machine were what they called creels, which were just this network of posts that you would put huge spools of yarn on. And then that yarn would be threaded through the machine into the tufter that actually tufts the carpet. I would find them sleeping in the creels while their machines were running. Like, so for me personally, I saw how in a union workforce, it could drastically hurt productivity. Um, I also saw people getting injured because they were slacking off and not paying attention. And those machines literally could kill you. So my experience personal with, Unions has not been great. At the same time, I totally understand why they exist. So I tend to say it makes more sense in labor-intensive jobs where literally your life is on the line or you could lose a finger. A lot of it is just safety precautions, OSHA. If you don't have a union there, a lot of times the company won't follow safety protocol because they don't have to. So again, warehouse jobs at Amazon absolutely needs a union. They should have had a union on day one. The fact that Amazon is union busting is disgusting. When I start thinking about white collar jobs and unionization, I get a little reticent because I'll be honest with you, any job I've been a supervisor in, if I had unionized employees, let's say, and some of some games writers are in unions now, by the way, Kotaku's writers formed a union. If I had had people in the union working underneath me, it would have hurt us production wise like we wouldn't have been able to produce as much content the company would not have have done as well as it did so it's tough but i think it's a case-by-case -case basis working crunch and not being able to stand up for yourself and if you for fear of i'll get fired if i complain about crunch that's a problem and in that case a union could probably step in but you have to also remember that a lot of states, California included, are at will states, meaning the company can fire you for any reason. They, it, they just could be like, I don't like how you look. You're fired and you're fired. It's not just California. It's pretty much the entire United States. So it's a tough question. And I do have sympathy for people who work, who work and are in unions because typically they have tough jobs. They have manual labor jobs where they're working outside or they're working with their hands. That's what I associate with union people. And in those jobs, 1,000% there should be unions. When we get to start talking about white collar jobs, it's a little different. But if an employee is ever being abused by their employer, then yeah, there should probably be a union. All right, our next question comes from Patreon. Awesome. From Simon Wallace. 
Hey Shane, you've often said that you never really get the chance to go back and replay classic games from the past. If there was suddenly a pause on releasing any new games for a whole year, what classics would you go back and replay now that you've had the opportunity to do so? That's a great question, Simon. And to be honest with you, one of those games I just played. <laughs> one of the games that I would have gone back and played again if I had extra time is Resident Evil 4. And luckily they've remade it and made it better. So I actually just did that. And I think that's really the point here is that I don't know if I will ever go back and play old games anymore because any game that I would think is good enough for me to want to go back and play it again, if you're paying attention, almost all of those games are being remade. And almost in like 95% of the time, the remake is better than the original game. So I just think organically, the way the industry is working, that there's not a lot of opportunity really to go back and play great games from the past because almost all the truly great games from the past are being remade and being better. So from my perspective, I feel like I can just kind of sit tight and eventually in a year or two or th whatever, that game is going to be there for me to play again and it will be re relevant. So I can play it for you guys and it has value again. The reason I don't do it is because there's no value in it typically for me. Now I'll say this, I have been bouncing around the idea of going back and looking at my old reviews, because I've been reviewing games since 1997. So I've thought of the idea of going back and looking at my reviews for games, classic games, and then playing them now and seeing if I was insane or if my reviews held up. Now, what spurred this idea on is that I gave Resident Evil 4 a perfect score at X-Play back when it came out in 20, 2005, and here we are, all these years later and I played it again and I was like, hot damn, I was right. Now, I don't think I'm gonna be right all the time. It might be an interesting new segment for you guys. So if that's something that you might be interested in, let me know in the comments below. Also, you guys never comment on Patreon. I have no idea why. You guys never leave a comment about anything unless there's something wrong and I do appreciate that, but it's a little disheartening that the only time you ever get comments is when somebody complains about something. So if you could, maybe pipe up a little bit more in the comments that would be helpful it would also help me to know what you guys like and what you don't like so that we can program content that you guys are going to enjoy more feedback in general from you guys would be awesome so i don't think there's a lot of games that i would go back and play now unless i decided to do that new idea that i came up with but i don't think generally there's a lot of games i would go back and play because i think inevitably in a year or two they're probably all going to be remade <laughs> All right, our next question is also from Patreon, from Jerry Gonzalez. With the success of The Last of Us on HBO, what do you want to see turned into the next big sensation? Again, Jerry, this is kind of one of those things where it's happening organically. It is just happening. Because, let's be honest, Hollywood is kind of run out of ideas. I really feel like, generally, TV and film is just kind of starting to eat itself. It's like the cat chasing its tail at this point. And more than ever, and they've done this for a while, but more than ever, they are looking to video games for new for ideas for new TV shows and films. So it's all kind of happening. Like I would have said The Witcher. There's already a great Witcher TV show. There's most of the properties that have interesting stories have either had a TV show or a movie made about them. And in fact, there's so many announced now that I can't even remember if the ones that I would pick have already been like greenlit and they're already in production. For example, Bioshock. Bioshock definitely would be an amazing TV show or film, either one. And I think, not 100%, not 100% but I do think that there is either a movie or a TV show about Bioshock already in the works. And that's the thing, like they're all already in the works. If I look back through all the games that have the best stories, like Mass Effect and things like that, almost all of them, are either in production for TV or film, or in a matter of like a few months, there'll be announcement that is, and even like stuff that you don't think would work, like te the Tetris movie. You know, I realize the Tetris movie was mostly a doc documentary, but there's so many game franchises that you don't think would even work as TV and film that they're trying to turn into TV and film. Werewolves Within, which was this obscure Ubisoft VR game that hardly anyone played. It, was, it has already got the treatment. So there's just really, nothing left between all of the streaming services. And that's really what's happened here is that you have all these streaming services, separate ones that need exclusive content to get people to subscribe to their service. And I think that's why you're seeing 
Netflix start to wilt is because now it's competing for all this stuff. Before, it was the only show in town, and people just immediately went, well, if we have this idea, we're going to Netflix. Now you can go to like four or five different services to shop your products to, which is great for creators because now you can leverage those other offers to get more money for your projects. It's all to the good. I'm just explaining kind of way what the, the reason things are the way they are. For example, I just dropped Netflix. I was a Netflix customer from the day it launched. And last month, I dropped my subscription for the first time. And I'll say this too. I did not get anything from Netflix. I did not get an email saying, man, you have been with us for 18 years and we thank you. Here, come back for the first three months for half price. I didn't get any of that. I, when any of you drop your subscription on our old subscription system on Sifted, I send you a personal email. A personal email that I type by hand. It's not a form email. It's just me wanting to say thanks. Netflix couldn't even be bothered to send me an auto form email saying, wow, man, you gave us a lot of money over 18 years. Thank you. And if you would like to come back, here, we'll give you Netflix for half price for the first six months. or Nothing like that. They were just like, see ya. And that is going to be bad for Netflix because more people are doing what I'm doing. And if they don't feel like they were appreciated when they leave, they're not coming back. Like it's going to take something major for me to resubscribe to Netflix because, again, I haven't had it for a month now. I haven't missed it. So all those services are now demanding content. And that's why I, anything I could suggest that should be made into TV or film it's already in the works or it's going to be in the works in the next year and a half. It's just the way it is. Hi All right. Our last question for today's episode comes from Commander Fett. Do you think there will ever be an actual competitor to YouTube? It seems like every time someone tries to make something, it fails and tons of money is wasted. What do you think would need to happen for a platform to succeed? Do you think if enough people left YouTube because they changed their algorithm too much, it could happen? Well, there was an opportunity for a replacement for YouTube way back when. It was this little website called GameTrailers.com. And because Viacom was suing YouTube and we weren't allowed to work on YouTube, ironically, Game Trailers <laughs> collapsed. So I guess you're, that answers your question right there. No, I don't think that anyone is ever going to overtake YouTube. And how do I know that's not going to happen? Well, I'll tell you how. Because what one of the things that really crushed Game Trailers was as our revenue started to shrink because all y'all were going to YouTube to watch video game trailers instead of watching them on GameTrailers.com. And to be fair, we were serving ads in front of video game trailers. People were angry about that. I could kind of understand it. But the problem was our revenue was going down, so we had to increase our ad frequency. Like for years and years, um, you would get an ad every three or four videos you watched on game trailers. And this is very important. This is something that we watched every day. Our ad frequency, how is it affecting traffic? If we bump it up to like half videos, you get an ad. We could see the traffic go down. And so it was this very delicate balance we had to walk of ad frequency. Well, as our revenue went down and we became more desperate to stay alive, our ad frequency went to one-to-one, -one, which basically means almost every video you watched, you had to watch a pre-roll ad before it. And so after GT died and YouTube continued to explode, I thought to myself, I'm like, that's when YouTube will die, is when they get to the point Game Trailers was at where every video you watch, you're watching an ad. Well, people, we've been there for a long time now. YouTube has basically been one-to-one -one for like three years now, and it has done nothing. Why? Some may say there's no viable alternative, but really there are. There are multiple options. There are so many viral video websites out there that never do anything. They just, they exist and maybe they get a little bit of a foothold in whatever country they were launched in. But globally, they're just like, a, they're like a gnat on YouTube's shoulder that it just flicks away. So it's not like people aren't trying. It's just that getting people away from YouTube is almost impossible because the money that people are making. I think you're seeing this right now. There's a new streaming service called Kick that is trying to take on Twitch. And the only way that they're getting the streamers away and therefore the traffic away is to offer way better ad rates versus what you're getting on Twitch. And to be honest with you, the ad rates on Kick are insane. Like literally you make almost double the money on Kick that you will on Twitch, but people are afraid to leave because look at Mixer. So you have Ninja who left Twitch to go to Mixer. Mixer lasted what, like a year and it went away. Now he still made his money, but it didn't help him build his brand. Now he's back on Twitch again. I'm not sure if his audience is the same as it was before he left. I'm guessing it's probably just around the same. But there's all these things you take into consideration. And here's the thing. Like, 
YouTube's not going to fold until the creators leave. So you're saying that the change in the algorithm may make creators leave, but why? How, how would that work? Because if they already have, let's say, a million subscribers on YouTube, and they're like, oh, the algorithm's kind of screwing me. I only made $58,000 this month instead of $67,000 this month. And that's literally how much money some of the big YouTubers are making. They're not going to leave. They're like, I'm still making ungodly amounts of money I never dreamed I could make just for doing video game stuff. They're not going to leave because if they go to some other viral website, viral video website, how are they going to rebuild their audience again? How do they know that they're going to get paid? They understand the ecosystem. They know how the tools work on YouTube. They've learned how to manipulate the algorithm, the algorithm and the tools on YouTube already because obviously they're already really successful. So I'll be honest with you. I don't know what it would take. For YouTube to fail at this point because it's already in my opinion a terrible experience <laughs> just being honest um literally now you I'm sure some of you are sitting there saying what are you talking about I never watch ads on YouTube that's because you're watching on your PC watch it on your app on your TV watch it on your app on your console the way like 95 percent of YouTube audience is is consuming the website they have to watch ads there's no ad blocker for the app on my PlayStation 5 or my Xbox Series X or my Switch. There's no ad blocker on any of those devices. People, and I'm sure someone's going to be like, no, there is if you hack the blah, blah, blah. No, no one's doing that, dude. That's you. Yeah, you're crazy, and that's you. You're trying to avoid the ads. You're one of the people who crushed game trailers back in the day. So it's, it's come full circle now. Like, you would think, though, now that people can't use ad blockers because most people are using them using their apps on their TVs or their devices or whatever, you would think that YouTube would dial back the ad frequency, but that has not happened. Shocker. <laughs> well, you can't tell. <laughs> Anytime I talk about YouTube, I get pretty feisty. <laughs> I, I, gee, I wonder why. Uh, but anyway, thanks for checking out this episode of Ask Shane Anything. Again, please, when I put out the call for questions for either this show or for Pactor Factor, please respond. Like, you never know if your question is going to be the one question that's like the best one that we get from that whole batch. But we that's not going to happen unless we get volume of questions. So we're about to ask our questions for Pactor Factor literally in like two days. So if you're watching this and you see our posts asking for questions on Monday, please contribute. Um, it really, without you guys, these shows don't exist, one. And if they do, if we do get questions, sometimes they suck if we don't have enough people asking questions. So... Um, if you could do that, I would really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who's pledging at $7 or more per month. Without you guys, this show doesn't even happen at all. So um, just really would appreciate a little bit more engagement if we can get it. And again, like, tell me what to do. Tell me what you want. I can't adjust things or do things differently if you don't tell me. So any amount of feedback would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again to everyone who pledges at $7 or more per month. And thanks to every single one of our patrons.